So a few weeks ago, Apple bought this uh, little Israeli company called PrimeSense. And a lot of people are like, well, what, what does PrimeSense make? Well, they make 3D sensors. We saw them at the Consumer Electronics Show last year. But uh, we have a new, a new company that's using their sensor on top of an iPad, and they're going to change the world. And the sensor is called a structure sensor. The company is called Occipital. We're going to see it right now. And who are you? Uh, my name is Jeff Powers. I'm co-founder and CEO of Occipital. We started the company about five years ago. And before that, I dropped out of school, a PhD program at the University of Michigan to start a company. So straight to the company for me, no uh, previous employers. No, and, and you guys have built some remarkable products over the years. You did the red, red laser, right? Yep. That does scanning of stuff, and eBay bought that. Yes. And you did some 3D or 360 panoramic, panoramic yeah. Uh, yeah. app. Yeah. So uh, there's some smart people there. Something's going on. We have a good team. We, know, <laughs> we kind of pride ourselves in knowing kind of what's going to happen in the future of computer vision on mobile and trying to participate in it as much as we can. Well, we, we should uh, cover, we should start out by talking about PrimeSense because PrimeSense just sure. got bought by Apple. And you use PrimeSense as sensor in your product, right? Yeah. T tell me about the world of 3D sensors and why yeah. we need a 3D sensor instead of just a regular camera yeah. like this GoPro, you know? Yeah. So you know, regular cameras like that are, are awesome and they're, they're getting much, much better, but what they can't do is they can't sense actual metric size and scale of objects. And so to achieve the magical you know, experiences that we see in the movies where computers can just see and 3D map things instantly, we feel that it's better to have a 3D sensor than to try to do it from 2D images alone in computer vision. So that's why we think it makes sense. And maybe in the, in the future, maybe 10 years from now, the compute power will be so amazing and the cameras will be so good that we won't need these sensors anymore. But right now, we think it's just a huge um, no-brainer to add a 3D sensor for the apps that we're building. For a computer guy like you, what, what does that sensor show you that a 2D sensor can't show you? So it gives you metric distance to surfaces and objects. And so instead of sensing RGB colors, we now sense distance. So we know, we know the color of something from the camera that's built into like the iPad, but then the sensor itself gives us the metric distance. So we can say, you know, this point on that table is 18 inches away, and that other point is 21 inches away. And with all that information, we can reconstruct very accurately and very quickly a model of the world. And so now let's talk about your, your uh, sensor. Yeah. Can you show me it? And, uh, yep. What, why do we need this on our iPad? So this is our product here. Um, like you said, it's called the Structure Sensor. And until now, um, the only way to really get access to um, the kind of data that we just talked about, 3D sensing data and do reconstruction of objects, was using an external accessory that plugs into a computer. And yeah. so we saw a ton of opportunity to take that kind of tech and uh, put it into a form factor and make it friendly to work with iOS devices. And that's really what the structure sensor does. Now, this is not the latest PrimeSense sensor, because uh, the guy who started PrimeSense showed me a new sensor that's a yep. stick of chewing gum thick. Yeah, right? so there, there's, uh, those guys are working on something new that's using a new type of projector technology. And uh, as we understand, it's not ready for mass production. They, you know, the last we heard was maybe sometime spring of next year, or of this coming year. Yeah. Um, so we're actually using a slightly older projector technology. But when you look at our when we look at our product, you can see that it's basically, you know, it's approaching the form factor that you saw. Um, and we have new things inside. We have a battery inside. And the reason that we're getting close to the same size is because instead of having a plastic shell, we're using an anodized aluminum case to serve as both the exterior and as structural interior of the device. Interesting. And so uh, how much does this cost, first of all? So the, the overall device, including the, um, including the attachment, um, mechanism that hooks it up to the iPad and the cable and everything is 350 on Kickstarter. We actually just ended a Kickstarter campaign. Yep. We haven't announced what our future pricing will be, but we're taking pre-orders right now for $350. Okay. And who is going to use this? Is, is this going to be a real estate agent who needs to yeah. map out a, a building inside? Uh, tell me what kinds of use cases people you think people are going to use it for. There's all kinds of cool stuff. Um, you mentioned real estate. There's definitely a lot of people contacting us 
a lot of our backers are developers. In fact, many of them are interested in real estate applications. Some are interested in crime scene mapping and reconstruction. Um, some are interested in 3D scanning of objects and people. Um, kind of a new trend, maybe a fad, but it's taking off right now. S scanning people, scanning objects, 3D printing them. A lot of people want to be able to do that and not be constrained by cords and plugging into large computers. The idea of being able to scan mobile makes sense. And so a lot of people are going to be using it for that. And one other area that a, a smaller number of companies are working on, but we think is really exciting, is augmented reality gaming. The ability to map a space and then turn it into a game world that's very accurate. Um, so you can have very interesting ac interactions where, in fact, the virtual objects can duck and hide underneath real objects. And that starts to get really interesting. And I think that's why Apple bought PrimeSense, right? The company that makes your uh, sensor that you're including in here. Because I'm sure they're going to put this on a TV product of some kind. And now they have the same features mm -hmm. possible that are that uh, is in the, in the Xbox One with the Kinect sensor, right? Yeah. So the Xbox One is, of course, not using the same tech. Microsoft built something in-house that's a different technology but achieves the same kind of depth information. Um, and yeah, we don't know exactly what Apple's going to do with, with the PrimeSense technology. We're interested to see. Our, our big hope is that we can continue to innovate with the structure sensor and build amazing 3D apps um, on the iOS platform until such future time that this tech becomes built in. I mean, at our core, we're a software company. That's what we're building. You know, the, the things that we're most excited about are our computer vision algorithms and engines. Uh, we just needed the sensor to exist, and so we brought it into the world. Well, the neat thing about the way you're building the sensor is you're putting it on an iPad, a, a mobile platform right away, uh, where the Kinect is meant to sit on a TV or next to a TV and be watching a room. And yeah. yeah, that's great for that room, but hey, we're out in the world, you know, going yeah. shopping. Um, here you can do something. Can you show me what it, what it sees and, yeah. and then give me some examples of things that you're, you're playing with? So let's start out with just a really simple demo here. I'll just literally show you what it sees. And so here you can see, um, I'm showing you this color, which is representing distance. You can see the table in front of us is red and yellow yep. to indicate its distance. And if I put my hand here. Yeah, so now your hand is white, sort of indicate that it's at the, the minimum closest distance. Okay. And as you go further away, it gets a different color. Yep. I can also switch to another view here where we see the raw depth. So you can see someone sitting over there. It's 300 and some centimeters away. The wall is 400 centimeters away. The table is about 58, 40, 44. 39 centimeters away. And my hand Your here. hand is 35 centimeters away. Okay. So, so that's the raw data that comes from the sensor. So let's flip out of that app. Um, would you like to see another demo? Yeah, keep going. Cool. That's cool. So let's head into um, what we call uh, scanner demo. And what we can do here is point at this camera that's sitting on the table. I've got a very familiar multi-touch gesture here. I can mm -hmm. just scale the size of this cube and so that it fits the, um, the camera on the table here. Yep. And then you can see the cube's actually resting right on the table. I can press scan, and here we're capturing a model of this camera. I can move around at pretty normal rates. I don't need to go super slow. The system is yep. tracking my motion the whole time. Be careful, you're, you're, li you're um, mic'd in. Though. I'm mic'd in, so I'll, I'll just stop here. Okay. Um, and we'll go sit back down. But what we did just here is captured a model of this camera. Now this is using some very early prototype coloring code. So the color isn't that good, but if I pop on the mesh, you can see a pretty good quality, all things considered, um, simple model of this camera. And so you could, you could share this with someone. You could send it to a 3D printer. You could even send it virtually to an online 3D printer. We have a button here that sends it to Shapeways, but you could send it to MakerBot Thingiverse. You could send it to all sorts of different services. Oh, that is cool. And if you are more careful with it, it'll get sharper as yeah, you walk around? it will enhance over time. I can also show you a, uh, a black and white monochrome scan where we're just focusing on the mesh itself. And so okay. here we're just getting all the, the geometry of the object. Yep. So we could continue, of course, if I could walk around and get the whole, the whole object. So that's, that's another demo app. Yep. Um, and we can pop into one more demo uh, that yeah. makes sense here, I think, on the table. So this one, this one's called, this one's called Fetch. Um, and whoop, I'm having some strange behaviors. Okay, what I'm going to do here is 
I'm actually going to scan this object again. Okay. But instead of what we did before, which was use it as, um, as an object we wanted to scan, instead what we're going to do is actually use it as a, uh, an object in a virtual game. And so I now have this virtual cat that is going after this ball. Now, I didn't map the full table, so it's running right off the table. But you can see I dropped this ball, and it bounces right off of that object. That is cool. So new kinds of games are possible, new kinds of entertainment, new kinds of kids' photos. Exactly. Um, and even some, I, you know, when I went to the Connect Sense uh, uh, tech star startup, uh, startup incubator up in uh, yeah. Seattle, <clears throat> they are doing scanning of bodies, and they yeah. figured out they could get within a quarter inch of your body, so they could yeah. put custom clothes on you and yeah. do all sorts of fun stuff. Right. That's another cool thing we didn't even really talk about earlier, which is the ability to use this in home to scan a human body and, like you said, recover a model. Use that model then to do clothes shopping without you know, having to go to the store anymore. Because I hate clothes shopping. It's a huge time suck. If I could just see 100 different garments on my body all at once, that would radically uh, change the, the way people shop, I think. Where, so you sold uh, on Kickstarter, I think, one point something million yeah. dollars worth of these things yeah. at 300 and something a pop, 350 a pop. Where do you think this is going? And, and is this going to be a, a billion dollar business someday? Or is it just going to start being built into, um, and let me turn that off. Is it just going to be built into uh, the products that we yeah. know and love? I think the hardware eventually is. Like what we're doing with a billion dollar idea that, that I see we're going after is more of the software that powers this. Because no matter what sensors you have, you need an amazing software engine to put all that data together very rapidly. That involves amazing processing that's on the device. It involves cloud processing. It's a, very, it's a big challenge, just in the way today that computer game engines are these huge monolithic beasts that only a few companies can build. Um, in the same way, I think vision engines will be the same way. And so I think the billion dollar thing we're going after is that. But that said, uh, you know, we intend and hope to have a long life building this awesome hardware accessory as well. And I'm excited to work on generation two and beyond because I think there's a lot we can do for the next few years before this tech makes its way in. And frankly speaking, we may see one or two devices that have these sensors, but I personally believe they'll be small successes or even failures until we have the software to back up why do we need these sensors. Yeah. These sensors are great for a room, like you were pointing it around. Yeah. It's not good for walking into a baseball stadium True. and seeing the whole baseball stadium yet, right? Yep. It can't see that far. Can That's it? right. Yeah, they can't. They, they have a limited range, so they're really good indoors. They're good with objects the size of a person, smaller than a person, up to the size of a room. But yeah, if you take it into a stadium, it, it can't work. And it, it's based. It's basically based on the same principle that human eyes are based on. You have a certain parallax, a certain distance between your two eyes. And, and you can see objects that are roughly some relative fraction of this distance away. But if you look you know, into the great distance, you can't really predict exactly how many miles away something is. And in the same way, these sensors have the same type of problem. So even if you had a stereo system which could theoretically see really far, its accuracy at far ranges is not very good. So in that case, what we do is rely on a different technique where we track motion as the user walks around a huge, you know, walks around the stadium, and we then recover the stadium's geometry um, over a long period of time and images from people all over the world and things like that. And people are already working on this particular problem. It's not something we use every day, but the technique is. is different. Well, I think uh, you know, eventually, uh, if we come back in ten years or something like that, um, we're going to walk into a baseball stadium, aim our camera at. Yeah home plate and it's going to tell us all sorts of stuff about what's on the field yeah you know? and it's sort of like our tv does today right yeah. when you watched america's cup it showed you the whole fee the whole uh, uh course right mm -hmm. uh, for the america's cup out on the bay even though our eyes can't perceive where those uh, markers are right. right but but uh they could with computers put down the field and flow patterns and wind patterns and all sorts of stuff and that makes your uh, experience at a sporting event like that much more enjoyable, right? Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, there's a lot of information like that that contextually makes sense to present to people. Um, but today we have no medium to present it because AR isn't good enough and tracking isn't good enough. And, but like you say, in 10 years, it's going to be there. And then the challenge is going to become building the apps and figuring out 
what information do you present and what do you not present? Because the answer isn't present everything, right? The answer is figuring out how to get away with just the right amount of information and understand what the user wants. And we're not even really facing that problem yet because we don't have the underlying tech to present stuff well enough. But I think in 10 years, we'll be facing that problem. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting uh, uh, world to watch. I think that's why Apple bought in. I think that's why Microsoft bought in. Uh, certainly, if you could make this smaller to fit on a phone and you're walking through a store and it's mapping out the world in real time. Yeah, or that, Google Glass, right? Well, Google Glass is a good example. I, I, you know, it's still a ways from getting a sensor, even a bubblegum sensor, uh, on there. Yeah. And then the battery life and the computation power to deal with the data flows yeah. that are coming off that sensor are are a little bit uh, uh, taxing at the moment, right? For sure, we're pushing, we're pushing the limits of what you can do on these devices. I mean, our demos seem fast, 30 frames per second, but I can't tell you how hard it was for our team to pull that off. And it's, it's gonna be pushing the limits of devices for the next five years, I think. But it's gonna be cool to watch because it's gonna get more and more accurate. I didn't even think about this, but you, you showed me a new I iPad Air, which yeah. has a new 64-bit uh, processor. Yeah. Are you pushing that processor to its uh, uh, limits? You know, we can do more, but we already are using basically all the resources. So there's a lot more that we can, uh, that we can do to push it even further, but I mean, we've done all the easy stuff. And so it's, it's, certainly, um, it's certainly a challenge to make that happen. What, what else are you, because you're building a sensor company, I'm sure you're now getting all the sensor catalogs from every, every uh, <laughs> lab that's making sensors. Yeah. What else are you seeing happen in the world and, and does this fit into a bigger context yeah. of things happening? I think it does. I mean, there's a few other companies out there that are building sensors. Um, there's, there's nobody that's doing exactly what we're doing today. I'm sure that'll change. Um, there's a company called uh, Soft Kinetic, there's a company called PMD. They both make time of flight sensors, which are an interesting technology. What is time that? of flight? So they, they literally measure in some way the time that it takes light to travel and return from a surface. So, so they're amazing. throwing a laser. Yeah. In fact, doesn't Prime Sense do a little bit of the laser pattern? There's as a well? laser based projector technology. And yeah. um, sometimes they use lasers, um, sometimes they use LEDs. So a lot of the guys that are using uh, time of flight, including the Connect from Microsoft, are using. LEDs, and so they're just blasting the scene with light and watching how fast it takes for that light to come back. It's kind of amazing to think that we can measure the time you know, at the speed of light. It's not infinite. Um, so there's that kind of technology out there, and there's, there's other things in the space. But it'll be interesting to see how it evolves and as we get new players building sensors. Yeah. How, what got you attracted to this? Because you've been working on this for two years now before yeah. most people knew what a, a Kinect sensor was. So uh, yeah. what got you in, in, into this world? So a couple of years ago, we were playing with a Kinect, and we were also trying to build an augmented reality engine at the same time. And we saw what we were able to pull off ourselves. It was kind of like some of the stuff you see with the flat markers or a little bit of mapping, but it's not very accurate. And then we played with a Kinect, and it was really clunky and plugged into the wall, but we saw these amazing things that we could do. In fact, some of the prototype code that we played with was one of the Connect Accelerator companies, ManCTL, they made an app called ScanAct. We were playing with their app, um, and we saw how amazing it could be if we just had that on mobile. And we knew that it wasn't going to go anywhere if you still had to plug it into a big computer. So it had to be brought to mobile devices. We looked around, and there was nothing out there. And so that's what led us down the path of moving from being a pure software company, which is what we had always done, to figuring out how to build hardware, growing our team, creating this device, and now launching it two years later. Uh, Leap Motion, another uh, sensor company, uses a sensor that's facing up from your keyboard to watch your hands and yeah. do a new kind of gesture-based um, human-machine interface, right? Yeah. Are you able to do the same thing by turning the sensor up and, you know, and aiming it up, and then can I use my hands to do new kinds of gestures or new kinds of uh, inter interfaces? So those guys are doing cool stuff, um, not really the same as what we're doing. Um, conceivably, though, a developer with structure could take this cable, which is what we call our hacker cable. Instead of plugging into the iPad, it plugs into USB. And so you could imagine um, you know, looking up at a person's hand and processing the raw feed coming from the camera and doing some of that same tracking. But intrinsically, the device wasn't built to do that. And so I can't say it would be as good as Leap Motion. But they're similar in terms of they're both infrared-based input devices. Yeah. Um, 
There's another company called Umove that watches your face. Mm -hmm. uh, are you thinking of working with other companies that are pushing the technology in another way, not yeah. not the way you are, but yeah. to join them together to make a new kind of game available or a new kind of I, interface? I think what's so awesome about this kind of hardware renaissance that we're seeing now, smaller companies starting to build hardware again, I think, I think what's interesting about it is we're all building these kind of crazy things that we're not even sure if there's a big enough market. You know, they're not devices that on their first year are gonna sell a billion dollars worth of goods. But, you know, they, they'll sell millions and that's enough for small startups, right? And so what's cool is we have all these different things. We have the Oculus Rift, we have the structure sensor, we have Leap Motion, we have the eye tracker that you mentioned. Yeah. What I think is and really cool. a few cool, others, I'm seeing yeah. Meta, which makes some the glasses. The Meta glasses, and... yeah. So what I think is awesome about that is that we can now kind of put all these things together that otherwise wouldn't have existed were it not for all these small companies. We can start to put them together and imagine, you know, what's, think one step further. So if I can put a head tracker on, use a structure sensor, have a Google Glass on, I don't know, I can start to imagine some future interface. And the user experience will be bad because these tools weren't built, you know, with these feature apps in mind. But what they'll do is they'll let us imagine the future apps. What if you could scan a room with an Oculus, or with a structure sensor, display it in an Oculus Rift halfway around the world, basically in real time. Okay, what applications become possible then, right? So yeah. that's, that's what I'm most excited about. When I visited PrimeSense at uh, CES, they had a company called uh, Shop Reception there mm -hmm. that was putting uh, uh, PrimeSense sensors over the, uh, people's heads at like a Walmart. Yeah. And we're able to watch uh, shopping analytics, the movement of people in space. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking of doing that? Because you've, you've given us a, an affordable way to do that in a, like my brother's bar, he could buy an iPad and a, yeah. And, uh, you know, one of your sensors and, and go to town, right? You know, I hope people do stuff like that. We don't know exactly what are all the cool applications, right? We're not, since we're not experts in all these fields, we don't know if having a mobile sensor is kind of a game changer or not. But what we did, just in case it is, is we, we made it super open and hackable. So these people can build companies, products around the sensor. Um, and we made it very hackable. We have, like I said, a special cable that lets you plug it into pretty much anything. On the bottom of the sensor, there's standard screws that you can, you can screw in and build your own attachment bracket. Even this thing I'm showing you here on the iPad Air is actually a prototype 3D printed bracket. We're printing this on Shapeways. Yep. And so, uh, you know, this is, this is, this is printed, print to order, sent to us, you know, via the web. You don't need to have any fabrication facilities. So someone could have an idea, print their own attachment that puts it on the wall, the ceiling, um, gets this cable and then goes to town with a new solution. That's pretty cool. How, how were you funded? Because you, you made some money off the sale of Red Laser yep. and uh, yeah. and you sold, did you sell the uh, 3D, the Three, 360 is still ours. Yeah. 360 so we, is still We still yours. run that. Yeah, so we sold the um, Red Laser app and reinvested basically that money and also raised a Series A from Foundry Group um, and also a minority stake from K9 Ventures, Manu Kumar. Yeah. Um, Manu always gets his fingers in, in the coolest stuff. I, yeah. I, I've noticed that. <laughs> Whatever that guy gets his fingers into is pretty cool. And usually he has, uh, he, like he, he uh, invested in Nitro yeah. and, uh, whole, and the coin that we just saw. Yeah. So he, he's getting his fingers in cool stuff. Yeah. Is there anything else we should know about this sensor uh, and, and maybe its capabilities? Or First of all, it's coming out soon, right? Yes. So, so the you're first, shipping by the end of the year. Yes, we are. So the first thing you should know is that um, the Kickstarter campaign is over, but people can now pre-order sensors on our site, which is structure.io. So if anybody wants to get their hands on one of these early and develop something, um, grab one on structure.io because we only have a limited quantity of those. We're basically building ahead to demand. So, um, you know, I recommend pre-ordering and not waiting. We're not going to charge people um, until, at least currently, we're not charging until ship. So it's a good time to get in. Um, other than that, uh, some cool stuff for people to know is that the sensor is able to take advantage of the very high-res camera on the iPad, and it fuses the high-res iPad camera color image with the sensor data which means comparison to some of the existing sensors out there, you're gonna have a much more gorgeous color image and that's gonna result in better scans, better mapping. I, um, I didn't think about this, but can I put that on an iPhone? 
You can, yeah. So you can plug it into an iPhone, although we don't officially support the iPhone because we're not making attachment brackets for the iPhone and right. not officially marketing it as being supporting the iPhone. But the Lightning Connector is the same. But some kid with a 3D printer has got to figure that out. Right? They're going to do that. <laughs> we're we're going to encourage that. We want people to do whatever they want with this thing. So, so you can do that. You can attach it to those devices. And the iPhone 5S is very fast. Yeah. Um, one other thing for people to know is, um, is that uh, if somebody has a cool idea to... Uh, use the sensor as part of a permanent installation. Let's say you want to put it on the wall at your office and build a face scanner for people to like get scanned in when they walk in and unlocks the door, for example. Um, you can actually do that, and the sensor is capable of passing power through and charging the iPad. So you can have this plugged in on the wall, doing cool scans of people walking by or whatever you want. And that's kind of a cool feature that um, we didn't really ever talk about. And we're excited for people to use that. How, how long will the battery last on this so so, if you're shooting with it full time? So we did some cool stuff so that the sensor basically goes to sleep when it's not being used. So you can keep it plugged in. But if you're shooting, if you're scanning full time, 100% power, um, the sensor will run for about four hours straight from the battery. Okay. Typically speaking, that means multiple days of use because you don't run it for four hours straight for most applications. You'll get tired walking around with the sensor for... Now. Are you are you walking around and mapping neighborhoods <laughs> you know, by aiming your uh, Not, sensor all over the place? We're we're trying to get mapping of our office working first, and then we'll map neighborhoods. Very cool. Where do we get uh, more information? On? So go to structure.io. We also have a cool video on our Kickstarter, so you can search structure Kickstarter um, and get a, a pretty nice video demonstration of it working. Um, there's cool articles all around. TechCrunch had a cool in-person interview to check out, which really shows the the structure sensor in action and. And actually, this video is one of the cool new places to see our prototype brackets, which we haven't shown until today. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. for coming out. It's really, really cool to see where this world is going. And you can tell the big boys are interested in it now because they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to buy these companies. So that's right. Thanks. And uh, looking forward to seeing what's coming next. Good to be here. Thanks.